Once again, hello everybody and welcome to the webinar. Today we're going to be going over expat tax documents made easy. Joining me today we have one of our amazing accountants, Alan. He has been working almost exclusively with expat since 2013 and he's also been an expat himself living in South Korea for 10 years and Denmark for two. So he's uh, definitely no stranger to the expat lifestyle. Um, in addition to understanding the intricacies of expat tax preparation, he really excels at guiding individuals through the IRS audit process, um, leveraging his seven years of experience as a corporate auditor. So Alan will be joining us later on when we do our live Q&A, um, so I'm excited for that. Um, and my name is Tabitha. I have been an expat myself as well. I lived abroad for quite a few years, um, so I know full well the joys and headaches that can come with that. I'm also an IRS enrolled agent, so my goal is really to simplify the tax prep process and help our clients by providing clear guidance and answering expat tax questions. Today you'll be learning a little bit more about who is Greenback. We'll have a review of U.S. expat tax basics, um, tax documents that you'll receive, information that you'll need to track down, um, as well as tax documents for specific groups. And then lastly, we'll have some common challenges and how to solve for those. So to tell you a little bit more about Greenback, I'd like to introduce you virtually to our co-founders, David and Carrie McKeegan. Um, they are expats just like you, um, and after years of living abroad, they really got fed up with the hassle of filing U.S. expat taxes. So in 2009, they built a new tax preparation company to make life better for expats everywhere. So we really focus on accountants with expertise specifically in this type of tax work. We try to make the process as simple and easy as possible, and we treat everyone fairly and respectfully. So it's really personalized care that you can take with you anywhere you go. We have, like I said, dedicated expat expert accountants. Uh, we have an accuracy guarantee, and we sign off on everything we do, fully backing up our work. And we've also been featured in places like the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, CNBC, the Inc. 5000, Bloomberg, just to name a few. And like I mentioned earlier, stay till the end to get your questions answered. So throughout the presentation, if you have questions, feel free to enter those into the chat box and we'll get through as many of those as possible at the end when we do our live Q&A. Um, one important thing to remember is other attendees can see the chat, so please don't share any sensitive information. If you have a more sensitive question, feel free to email us at info at greenbacktaxservices.com. And if you want a more in-depth discussion, we also offer one-on-one -on -one consultations with our experts like Alan for you to get more specific information re regarding your situation. So first, let's review some U.S. expat tax basics. If your worldwide income exceeds the filing threshold, you must file a U.S. federal tax return each year regardless of where you live. Income includes things like wages, interest, dividends, and rental income. The filing thresholds for the 2020 tax year are 12400 if you're single. That doubles if you're filing jointly. However, if you're married filing separately, which is a very common status if you have a spouse who is not a U.S. person, that threshold's only $5 before you need to file a tax return. Um, and if you're self-employed, that drops to $400. Uh, lastly, if you're head of household, it's a little over 18,000, but there are special rules for who can claim head of household, so you'll wanna check with an accountant to make sure you can claim that status. The U.S. tax year has various deadlines as well. So the tax year runs from January to December, and the main deadlines are March 15th, for all partnerships, S-Corps, and foreign trusts. April 15th is the standard U.S. deadline if you're living in the U.S. However, this year that was postponed to May 17th. Um, interest will accrue on any taxes due after that date. So even if you qualify for the automatic extension until June 15th, or if you file an extension request granting you till October, if you owe taxes, the interest will start to accrue after May 17th for this year. And there's three common tax credits and exclusions that expats typically use to lower or even eliminate their U.S. tax liability. The first of which is the foreign earned income exclusion. With this exclusion, you can exclude up to $107,600 of your foreign earned income from U.S. taxation on your 2020 return. To pass, however, you need to qualify, and you do that with either the physical presence test, which is where you are inside a foreign country for 330 of any 365 day period, or you can use the bona fide residency test. 
This one, you need to have lived overseas for one calendar year and have no immediate intention of moving back to the US. Another option is the foreign housing exclusion. So if you qualify for the FEIE and your foreign housing costs were at least 16% of the FEIE amount, you can exclude certain household expenses from your US taxes. This makes sense if you're earning over that $107,000 mark and you need to exclude additional income. And the last option is a foreign tax credit. This is basically a dollar for dollar credit for income taxes paid to a foreign country. You can't apply this credit to income that was already excluded with the foreign earned income exclusion, but you can carry back or carry forward unused credits to get a refund from prior year or to reduce future taxes. So for example, if you're living in the UK, which has a very high tax rate, oftentimes you're gonna have excess foreign tax credits when we go to file the US return. You can, like we said, carry that back a year or you can carry those forward to future years. There's also foreign financial reporting requirements for expats. So if the combined total of your foreign financial accounts is $10,000 or more, you'll need to file the foreign bank account report, also known as the FBAR or the FinCEN Form 114 with the US Treasury. Also, if you have foreign financial assets of over 200K on the last day of the year or 300K at any point, you will need to file Form 8938 with the IRS to comply with the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, commonly referred to as FATCA. These amounts are doubled for married filers. So now that you know the basics of expat tax, these are the tax documents that you may receive. Income statements for wages, compensation, and tips. Based on where you live, the you need to find out which form you should be on the lookout for, or you can just request a statement from your employer. So in the US, that form is typically a W-2 form. In the UK, it's a P-60 or a P-45. Canada, it's a T-4 form, a 106 form for Israel, and a 2 NDFL form in Russia. You'll wanna research your country that you're living in and see what form they use for reporting income. Also, any interest and dividend income, regardless of how small the amount is, needs to be reported on your U.S. tax return. If you have U.S.-based institutions, they'll send you a Form 1099 to show the interest paid out, along with any dividends. If you're in another country, you might not get a form, so that will be up to you to keep track of the interest you've received. Also, if you purchased any stocks or securities, your broker will typically send you a statement with all of the purchases and sales of stock or other securities from the relevant tax year. These numbers will be used to report capital gains and losses on both U.S. and foreign investments. Um, so again, if you have U.S. investments, typically they will send you a tax form. If you're living in a foreign country, it will be up to you to keep track of what was sold during the year. Mortgage statement. So if you have a mortgage, your lender should send you a statement with information on the mortgage interest page which then, if you are itemizing your deductions, is a tax deductible expense that you can use to limit your tax liability. So, some more information that you'll need to track down. Last year's tax return is super helpful. This has all the information that you're gonna to need to carry over from one year to the next. For instance, if you use the foreign tax credit last year, you'll need to input that information exactly, especially if you carried back or carried forward any excess tax credits. Prior tax returns are also handy for checking personal info and getting numbers when filling out this year's information. It will just make the process go much faster. Note that your prior year tax return will not be used to calculate the recovery rebate credits for any stimulus checks you were owed but didn't receive. These credits will be based on your 2020 income. So there's also lots of miscellaneous income that people could have and the documents reporting that will kind of vary depending on which country. So, if you have a business that isn't a sole proprietorship, make sure you're getting profit and loss sheets from that. If you have part ownership in a foreign partnership or corporation, we'll have a lot record of that. If you have any gambling income, farming income, royalties, unemployment, um, alimony, even foreign disability income, all of those things are reported on the U.S. tax return. Lastly, if you have any foreign mutual funds, even if there is no income distributed during the year, We'll want to see statements of those because oftentimes foreign mutual funds are considered passive foreign investment companies by the IRS and that will require additional forms when you file your U.S. tax return. When it comes to housing expenses, if you qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion and your housing expenses exceed 16% of the FEIE, you can also deduct certain foreign housing expenses. 
This will include things like rent, utilities, personal property insurance, any leasing fees, furniture rental, parking rental, and repairs. And again, these really make sense to keep track of if you are earning over the 107 k mark to where you have additional income that needs to be excluded, and we can offset that with these housing expenses. Also, if you have children dependents and they have U.S. Social Security numbers, track the costs for their care. There is a child tax credit and a child and dependent care credit that can be used to reduce U.S. taxes for families. The child tax credit has increased to $3,000 per year starting in 2021, and to use this credit, you'll need the names and social security numbers for the dependents you wish to claim. You can also deduct qualifying expenses for child and dependent care. So keep a list of expenses, including the name, address, and ID number, if applicable, for your child care provider, um, health insurance and medical expenses summary, as well as any charitable contributions. Now, when it comes to the FBAR and FACA, those are your foreign financial accounts, and those need to be reported if you're over the thresholds. And for those, you'll need the name and address of your foreign financial institution, your account numbers, the highest balance during the year, the end of year balances, and joint ownership or signature, signature authority if applicable. This would be, for example, if you work for a company and they've granted you access to one of their bank accounts, you would actually include that account on your FBAR because you have signing authority over it. For the foreign financial accounts you'll need to report, as a general rule of thumb, any financial accounts you have, if you're over that threshold, you're going to want to put those on the FBAR and FATCA forms. For FBAR, this can mean financial accounts held at a foreign branch of a U.S. bank, foreign mutual funds, foreign issued life insurance or an annuity contract with a cash value, foreign stock or securities, foreign pensions, and obviously standard checking and savings accounts. For FATCA, similar, similar items, foreign pensions, foreign stock holdings, foreign partnership interest, foreign financial accounts, foreign mutual funds, foreign issued life insurance, hedge funds, and foreign real estate held through a foreign entity. So all of those things need to be reported on the FATCA forms. And if you want to qualify for the FEIE, you'll want to keep a travel calendar. The main qualifying test for the foreign earned income exclusion is the physical presence test. And for that one, you need 330 full days outside the US. So this is important, and that's why that travel calendar comes in handy, because you can track exactly what days you were in the US during that 365 day period. So again, keep in mind, these need to be full days. So any time spent traveling to and from the US won't count as a foreign day, and you need 330 foreign days. So you actually get a little less than 35 full days in the U.S. Now, tax documents for property owners. Records of real estate, property purchase, and sale are really important if you've sold property during the year. When you sell a property, you need to calculate and report any capital gains on your U.S. tax return. So contrary to popular belief, losses from the sale of personal property are actually not deductible, but still can be reported. You'll need documents from the purchase of the sale that contain the date of sale, the date of purchase, whether it's for business or personal use, the total costs and proceeds, as well as any information on improvements or repairs made while owning that property. Beware as well of phantom gains. So foreign property values must be converted to U.S. dollars when reporting to the IRS. If there's been large currency fluctuations since purchasing your property, it's actually possible to have a U.S. dollar gain even if there is no gain in your local currency. These are known as phantom gains and they are taxable. When it comes to rental income documents, you want to have the date you place your rental property in service, the purchase price and value of any improvements made as well as equipment bought, and a record of all rents received during the year. This will allow your account to properly depreciate the property as well as make sure you're paying tax on any profit received. Now, if you're retired, the tax documents you collect will be a little different. For this, you will want to, especially if you're retiring in another country, you'll be required to report any distributions you received from retirement accounts, including pensions, 401ks, annuities, profit sharing plans, and IRAs. If you've withdrawn money from these accounts, you should automatically receive a statement from your employer or your broker, and you can give that to your accountant when it's tax time. If you receive Social Security benefits, you'll be sent to form SSA. 1099, and if you receive the same sort of benefits from another country, you might not actually receive a record of that, 
So it'll be up to you to keep track of what was paid out to you so that can be reported to the U.S. If you're self-employed, the documents that you'll need are really related to any income and expenses that you had. So to help lower your U.S. income tax liability, you are allowed to deduct expenses that are considered both ordinary and necessary to generate self-employment income. These expenses include the cost of goods sold, home office expenses if you're working from home, business use of equipment and vehicles, etc. Also, keep a record of where you're paying self-employment taxes. The U.S. fortunately has totalization agreements with many countries to help avoid double taxation for social insurance taxes like Social Security and Medicare. If the totalization agreement states that you should pay social insurance taxes to your host country and not the U.S., you'll need a certificate of coverage from your local Social Security agency to show that you're paying self-employment taxes there. This will prevent you from having to pay self-employment tax again to the U.S. So, if you're behind on your U.S. taxes, the information gathering process is a little more complex only because you have more years to gather. So the most common way to get caught up if you're behind is with the Streamline Procedure. The IRS Streamline Filing Procedure allows you to get caught up by filing three years of late returns as well as six years of FBAR. So you'll use the same steps that we've outlined earlier when it comes to gathering documents. You'll just do so for three years and you'll get bank details for six years. Along with that, you'll also file a Form 14653 to certify that your tax delinquency was non-willful. While this may sound daunting, given the number of years, the advantages of becoming compliant penalty-free are huge. These include major cost savings and avoiding serious penalties like losing your passport, hefty penalties, or even criminal charges. Also, if you haven't filed for many years, 10 plus years, with the Streamline Procedure, you can get back on track by filing just the three years of late returns, which is obviously a huge time savings versus trying to go back and file for every year that you've missed. So there are definitely some challenges, especially for expats. Here are a few ways to help solve those. So missing a tax document. The easiest way to solve for that is to contact the issuer. So if you're missing a tax document, don't ignore it. Contact the issuer. In many cases, this will be your employer or your broker um, and have that resent. It could have been lost in the mail or otherwise misplaced. Um, even if you didn't receive it, especially if it was a U.S.-based fund, it was likely still reported to the IRS. So if the IRS received, for example, a W-2 or a 1099 in your name and they don't see that information reported on your tax return, that will likely trigger an audit and they'll want to see that reflected or amended to correct. Also, if you're having a hard time receiving mail overseas, use a virtual mailbox to receive U.S. mail while abroad. A lot of expats live in areas where it's challenging to receive U.S. mail or they travel around a lot, which makes it impossible to have a consistent mailbox. Use a virtual mailbox for this type of situation. You could try using the address of a friend or relative in the U.S., but that can be unreliable um, and trigger unwanted state tax filing obligations if the state thinks you actually live in that state. Virtual mailboxes, however, provide a personal, non-PO box mailing address for a monthly fee. You'll get email alerts anytime you have mail, and typically they'll just scan you. Um, and if you need the actual document, they can physically send you a copy as well. Um, typically, the fees are based on the number of openings, so you'll want to limit the mail that goes there. But for important things like IRS statements, definitely the virtual mailbox is the way to go. Do I need to transmit my foreign tax documents? Oftentimes, you do need to translate those documents. It doesn't have to be a formal translation. If you know the language, you can just highlight key numbers. So total taxes paid, total income earned, etc. And you can highlight that and send it to your accountant. It'll make it a little bit easier for them to make sure everything's being reported properly. If you own a business or have a more complex tax situation and you don't necessarily understand the language that well, you may want to hire a professional translator just to make sure you're fully understanding the foreign taxes that you've paid so that can be applied to your U.S. return. Now, a lot of people will live in countries where the host country's tax year is different from the U.S. The U.S. tax year is the same as the calendar year, January 1st to December 31st, but certain countries will use different dates. So Australia, for example, is July 1st to June 30th. The U.K. is April 6th to April 5th. And Costa Rica is October 1st to September 30th. So living in a country that has a different tax year in the U.S., make sure to keep monthly pay stubs to make it easier to see how much you earned between January to December. Because even if you're living in a country with a different tax year, 
when we filed a U.S. return, we're still reporting what was earned during the U.S. calendar year. So this oftentimes won't line up exactly with a lot of the foreign documents received. And if you're waiting on important documents and worried you'll miss the deadline, definitely let your accountant know. Oftentimes they can file an extension for you, which will give you enough time to get those foreign documents. Now, let's get to some of your questions. Looks like we have quite a few in the chat box, so we will answer those in the order received. Remember, when you're sending things in, please do not type any sensitive information as others can see this. So. Without further ado, let me introduce you again to Alan. He's going to be joining us. To Alan, and let's he's kick be joining off with us. The Q &A. And let's kick off with the Q and A. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending, and we've had so many great uh, questions. I have so much trouble keeping up with all of them uh, <laughs> in the chat box. So sorry, I tried to uh, re respond to as many as possible. But uh, you can always email us uh, afterwards or um, let's just fire away and go ahead and start with some of these questions. Okay, awesome. Yeah, well, let's dive right in here. Um, we have a question. I'm getting ready to become an expat to the UK. Other than what was already covered in the presentation, are there any documents I need to gather before I move so that I'm ready to file my U.S. expat taxes for the first time? Uh, mm, no, not necessarily, but you do want to make sure you, you update your address. Uh, there's a change of address form that you can file with the IRS. That way, if you get any notices, you can respond to those in time because they always come with deadlines and you don't want to blow those deadlines. But you might have some state uh, tax considerations, uh, especially if you're in California or New York. So you basically want to sever ties with your state, especially those two states. Uh, otherwise, uh, any income that you earn uh, in the UK or overseas might actually be taxed by those states. So just to give you a quick uh, guidance to that, uh, you know, you want to uh, change your driver's license uh, where you vote to register uh, and other such common things. You really want to make it seem as if you've completely and permanently moved out of that state. Definitely. All right, for the F bar, my bank doesn't have an easy way to show the highest balance over the course of the year. Monthly statements only show the ending balance. What's the easiest way for me to provide the max balance information? Okay, that, that question comes up quite a lot. And the simple answer is that you can just, whatever the, the statement that you get is, maybe it's monthly, maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's only annually. You can use the, uh, the highest balance uh, reported on that statement, the year end balance. Um, because in some cases, it's just too hard to determine. Uh, say, for example, this was an investment account instead, an investment account that you opened up in, in Europe. So perhaps you have some investments that are in euros, that are in great British pounds, that are some Swiss francs. Every day, uh, security prices go up and down, currency exchange rates fluctuate. So it'd be near impossible to figure out what the highest rate is. So uh, the short, quick, easy answer is uh, if if you can't find it on your own by looking through your uh, online at your transactions, just go by the, uh, the statement balance for each month or period that you get and look for that highest balance. Okay, wonderful. Uh, next question is, what happens if I didn't save my receipts for itemized deductions such as foreign housing expenses like rent and repairs? Can I still claim the deductions? Uh, yes, yes, for there, there are some uh, rules for business related expenses where you must keep the receipts, but this is a little bit different. These are for uh, personal deductions. So you can claim them. And what you should try to do is try to find a way to recreate that information. So did you, for example, pay by bank transfer or a credit card? Uh, you know, uh, if, if you made a payment to a bank, maybe you can go to them and get a copy of the receipt. Um, it, it's a good idea to get this information if you can and to keep it for three years because, um, well, the IRS is the most litigated organization in the world. And the vast majority of cases that they win is because they come in the tax court and they say, well, you made this claim. Where are your receipts? Where are your documents? And a lot of times, the majority of the cases are won by the IRS because the taxpayer simply doesn't have those. So go ahead and take that deduction. Try to get those receipts, re recreate them as possible. 
Um, but just realize if you're challenged on them, you're probably going to lose. Right. Okay. Uh, in 2020, a lot of expats returned to the U.S. due to COVID who had intended to stay abroad. Um, and so the IRS adjusted the requirements so certain individuals could still qualify. Can you explain how to track travel in those scenarios to still claim the FEIE? Uh, well, there's, uh, there's no set way that you have to track travel, but you, you generally do need to do it whenever you return to the States. Um, so a lot of people use different apps. You know, there's a lot of apps that were created just to kind of, you know, capture your travel experience and kind of share those with others, but you can use those. Some of them even work uh, on GPS, some of these apps, some of them are free. Uh, you can keep your own calendar or your own diary or your own list of dates that you've traveled. You can go back and look for receipts for airline uh, tickets, you know, flights when you arrived and your departs, different things along that, those lines. Uh, those, those are probably going to be your best bets. And if you travel a lot, I would simply suggest just going with one of uh, the number of apps that are out there to help you do that. Awesome. Uh, this is a question that's come up a lot, came up a lot in the chat as well, and it's regarding the missed stimulus payments. So the question is, do you need specific documentation to claim the missed stimulus payments? Um, and on the other hand, if you received your stimulus payments, will you need documentation on that for your taxes? Uh, you don't need any specific information to, to claim it, uh, but you, you, there is some sort of application process. So currently, you you know, you need a, a, obviously a valid social security number. Uh, so you can claim these in 2020 by filing a tax return. Uh, it was uh, after the first stimulus payment uh, last year, there was a way that you could actually go online and kind of apply for it through the IRS website. The IRS will probably do something like that again. Um, but, you know, we, we just have to wait and see. Now, uh, as far as any documentation received, uh, if you've gotten your stimulus payments, yes, the IRS have been uh, slowly sending out letters just confirming uh, how much uh, that uh, they've sent to you. Uh, so you can use those if you receive them to help uh, prepare your tax return. The IRS is actually doing a very good job given all the limitations that they normally have. And especially now in, in COVID with, with everything that's been going on, I really, uh, Sometimes I have a little controversy with the IRS, but I have to I give them applause here for really helping to try to get people their stimulus payments as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, when living in a country with a different tax year than the U.S., should I file my taxes in the host country or the U.S. first? Uh, there was a question about this in the chat box. I don't know if it was from the same person, but uh, this is a, this, you know, for countries, especially for the UK, where their tax year goes from April 6th of one year uh, to April 5th of the next, it, it just causes a lot of trouble. Okay, So it would make all of our lives easier if we could just sync up with the same calendar with where we lived, um, you know, if it's a different tax year. But unfortunately, uh, for U.S. tax purposes, you have to claim all of your income, and all of your expenses and deductions from January 1st to a December 31st, regardless of what your host country does. So this causes a lot of trouble. Uh, a lot of people ask, okay, do I need to file my return uh, before my US or after? I'm a little bit confused. Uh, for US tax purposes, it's not when you file that other country's tax return. It's when you actually pay that foreign tax. So that's that's really the key there. If you paid a foreign tax in 2020, then you can claim a foreign tax credit in 2020. Same goes for any other year. Awesome. Okay. Does the IRS get copies of tax documents from foreign countries? Oh, uh, they can. Uh, and they might. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of um, a lot of agreements and, and a lot of tax treaties with other countries. Uh, normally, it's a reciprocal agreement, saying you know if we agree to share information about your citizens in our country, you agree to do the same. So um, the way I believe it normally works, they're a little bit secretive of this because, of course, they're out there really just trying to catch you know the, the 
hardened criminals. Uh, is normally they, they make sort of a general request from a bank. I'll call it maybe a John Doe summons. They'll say, for example, that's what they did in Switzerland years ago. They go to the Swiss banks. They say, give us information on every account uh, in which a U.S. citizen is an owner or a signatory. Um, so can they get their inf your information? Yes. Will they get their your specific information you know, in, in reality, I don't know, but I would have to say probably not. Uh, but just file as you're supposed to every year and just don't worry about it. All right. Next question is, what conversion rate in source should I use to convert local currency to U.S. dollars? Also, if I'm working with an accountant, do I need to convert to U.S. dollars when I provide my tax docs? Oh, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, so... Uh, there's what rate do you use and then how do you go about getting that rate? I'll just kind of break it down into two different parts. Okay, so uh, generally you can use the rate on the date of the transaction. So what I mean is if you get paid on the 25th of every month, you can use that foreign exchange rate you know, on the 25th of that month to convert your salary to U.S. dollars. Uh, Sometimes you're paid differently. Uh, if you own a, a business, you know, you, you have income and expenses going out, you know, not, you know, not evenly throughout the year. So in cases like that, or basically all cases, you can also use the average exchange rate. Okay, now where do you get these exchange rates? Okay, uh, the IRS has some listed on their website. Uh, I prefer to go to the Federal Reserve's website and get uh, currency exchange rates from there. Uh, unfortunately, the Federal Reserve doesn't have all of the exchange rates, so you can actually use any of the, the major, um, major websites out there that list currency exchange, uh, like um, Oanda is a very popular one, and uh, EX, FX, uh, any really major and reputable uh, company, even a, even a bank's website, you can use exchange rates from there. Uh, do you have to provide the exchange rate to your accountant? Well, that simply depends on your accountant. Uh, at Greenback, what we try to do is we try to make everything as easy as possible. Uh, so normally I tell my clients, look, just, just go ahead and send it to me in uh, whatever currency it is. I'll gladly do the exchange rates for you. I'll save you a little bit of trouble and a little bit of hassle. Awesome. Okay, uh, another question we got is when moving back to the US, um, are there any special documents that I need to keep for tax purposes? Um, well, uh, not necessarily, but if you've been claiming, for example, the foreign tax credit, uh, then you wanna keep copies uh, of your, your foreign tax return and then any kind of receipts of payment that you got. Uh, just uh, in, in general, you know, just treat it as uh, anything else. Um, all your tax documents you generally need to keep for at least three years. Probably better to keep it for four or a little bit longer in case you're ever challenged by the IRS. You need to have that kind of document or that support. But coming in from a foreign country, I'd say that would, that would uh, be the, the first thing that comes to mind, just to have to support the foreign tax credit or any uh, banking records you have to support the amounts you're reporting on your FBARs. Okay, wonderful. Uh, next question. This is a big one. This showed up in the chat quite a few times as well. Um, but okay. passive foreign investment companies, PFIX, yeah. um, these have special requirements. They're often needed when folks have mutual funds. The question is, can you talk a bit about what expats should watch for um, and what documents they'll need if they do have these foreign mutual funds? Oh, wow. That is, a, that is a bomb of a question. So uh, get online and Google PFIX, and what you'll see is don't do it, don't do it, sell it, get rid of it right away, avoid, avoid, avoid. And honestly, uh, that is the best general advice. So why is that? You know, you're simply going out and, and you're investing some of your hard-earned money, you're, you're living in another country, you're doing it in another country. What's the big deal that it's, you know, in a foreign country? Well, for some reason, the U.S. created these really complicated tax rules about PFIX. And I, I could easily talk about this an hour, but I won't uh, bore everybody. Let me just give you the highlights. Okay, so number one, 
what is a PFICT? PFIC stands for Passive Foreign Investment Company. So it's generally a, when you have an investment account outside of the United States and you invest in a foreign mutual fund or an exchange traded fund, in some countries like the UK, they call these unit trusts, uh, that would be a PFIC. So it's, it's basically a, a pooled investment, right? It's not buying a share of a single uh, stock or a company. That's not a prefix. It's, it's a pool of multiple investments. Uh, so that's, that's a PFIC. Uh, what's the big deal about PFIX? Well, um, they're just, you know, in short, they're just taxed uh, punitively uh, by the IRS, uh, especially if you've had a PFIC investment for a number of years and didn't know that you actually had it. Okay, so uh, I also want to specify too that I, I don't want anybody worried about their foreign pensions, because in the case of a foreign pension where uh, it's just a general company pension, uh, you you don't have necessarily any choice whatsoever in how the investments are made, and there's some other criteria. You don't have to worry about P fix. It's when you go out and open an investment account on your own that you want to avoid these. Um, so in general. Uh, they don't necessarily make sense for the vast majority of people. Uh, it's better just to simply maybe open an investment account in the United States to avoid these altogether. Definitely. Um, okay, next question we have is how do you report a pension scheme opened by your employer um, and what information would you need for that? Okay, well, um, mm, that's a pretty tricky question. So, uh, I'll start with you have you just started a pension, right? And you haven't received any distributions from it yet. Because there, there's really a lot to it. It varies really depending on where what country this is from, how the pension was set up, if there's a tax treaty, there's many things to, to consider. So uh, your company sets up a pension for you. Great, fantastic. We all need to save for retirement. Uh, you will probably have to report that on an FBAR or foreign bank account report if it's over the threshold of compared with all of your other accounts. Uh, and you would report the name of the, the, the pension administrator, your account number, the highest balance if you know it, and some additional information as well. Uh, once it gets over the, the FACA thresholds, which we covered in the presentations, then you're gonna have to report this on form 89 to 38, the FACA reporting requirements. So you might actually be reporting the, reporting the same account twice, once on a FACA, uh, once on an F bar, but that's just the way uh, it is that we have to do. Okay, so I'll move along a little bit down the road. Say you've had the account for years, and then now you're starting to receive distributions from it because you've retired. Uh, there's no really easy question to that. Generally, everything from most countries that you receive is going to be included as taxable income, and you're going to pay full, normal, ordinary rates on that. But there could be a tax treaty between that country and the United States, which reduces the amount of tax you have on it, or even hopefully eliminate it, eliminates it altogether. So you want to get ahead of this situation as best as possible. Uh, the first thing to do is make sure you keep careful records uh, through all of the years of how much you contributed and how much your employer contributed because those two factors can really affect how much tax you might pay decades down the road. It's very, very important to keep these records for decades. Otherwise you might wind up paying a lot more tax than you, than you uh, need to. Okay, yeah, complicated topic for sure. <laughs> um, this question came up a few times in the chat as well, and it's, I haven't filed taxes for years. Could I just file for 2020 to receive the $1,400 stimulus payment? Uh, well, uh, yes. The, the short and the quick answer is, is yes. Uh, you might not have enough income, for example, to, to actually have to file uh, a tax return. So what some people have been doing, and I, I believe it's sort of been blessed by the IRS, is if you don't have any income, for example, your spouse is working or, or whatever, uh, then you can simply add $1 as interest income and then file your return. 
Um, but if, if you haven't filed for years and you're supposed to have filed because you had income over the, the limits, basically the standard deductions, uh, things can get pretty bad for you pretty quick. Uh, especially if you were supposed to file these foreign bank account reports, especially if you have started a, a corporation or a partnership or a company in a foreign country. Um, in certain cases, if there's just a lot of money you're not reporting that, you could actually be facing some serious criminal charges. Um, we recommend it's just go best to just go ahead and get right with the IRS. If you haven't filed for years, you probably want to look at the streamlined filing program, uh, which we can help you with. And uh, please email us if you're interested in that. We're glad to walk you through that process. Yeah, definitely. There's a risk there if you just file the 2020 return and you've had income and it should have been filing in years past because. I mean, worst case, the IRS could consider your prior year's willful lack of filing and exclude you oh. from the streamline. And then you need to file, you know, so much more. There's penalties. It's really just not worth that potential risk there. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the cases where the IRS might actually go to the country you're living in and ask that country for information. Uh, what they can do is they, they audit you and send you a letter if you don't respond or if you don't respond in time. They can actually do uh, prepare for you what's called a statutory tax return. So they're allowed to do that by statute or by law. And when they do that, they cannot take certain deductions or credits for you by law. And if you don't respond by a deadline, then then that's it. That's they say you owe a certain amount. There's not you can't argue about it in tax court or anywhere else. It's it, it's done. So. Uh, there's a lot of serious consequences of, uh, of not filing when you should. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, uh, we'll try to get to a few more questions here. Um, next one is, does the increased and now fully refundable child tax credit apply for those living outside the U.S.? Uh, yes, yes, it, it does. Uh, so you can get the child tax credit uh, no matter where you are. The idea is this is a credit to, to help children. American children. If you have any kids yourself, like I do, I've got a girl, you could probably see a picture in the background. It's, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, so you're entitled to it wherever you are, unless you take the foreign earned income exclusion by filing form 2555. If you do that, then you're not entitled to take the child tax credit. So if you are living overseas, uh, you do have children. Uh, what you might want to consider is not claiming the foreign earned income exclusion, but instead uh, claiming the, the foreign tax credit. Uh, it may or may not be a better alternative for you. It just depends on your income and how much tax you pay uh, in a foreign country uh, and, a, and a number of other issues. So that, that's something you should maybe come to us and talk about and we can we can uh, tell you what all the options are and help you figure out the best situation for yourself. Okay, thanks, Alan. All right, what if I've been filing U.S. tax returns religiously, but I haven't filed the FBAR? I now need to file the FATCA form, and so I want to come into compliance with filing the FBAR too. What should I do? Well, uh, I would, <laughs> uh, if you have not filed FBARs when you were supposed to, I would immediately and as soon as possible get those filed start on it today if you can. Uh, the reason being is that uh, the penalties start at $10,000 and they quickly increase. In fact, the penalties could be up to 50% of the account per year. So let me just give you a quick example of what I mean by that. Say you had $100,000 in a foreign bank account, right? Uh, and you didn't report that for three years. So you could be assessed a 50% penalty for every year. So that would be 50,000 for year one, year two, and year three. That's a $150,000 potential penalty that you're looking at. You, there, there is not gonna be any good result uh, if you get caught or questioned uh, about not filing FBARs uh, when you should have. So really you, you give this uh, issue some urgency get your FBARs filed as 
absolutely as soon as possible so you don't have to worry about some very harsh penalties. Contact us if you need help. Definitely. Yeah, we help people all the time get caught up on their F bars. And um, I just I'll pop over a link in the chat real quick. There are some programs in place, you know, and definitely you know, chat with us. See if you qualify for one of those just to get some penalty protection when you're getting caught up on things. Yeah. Um, no all right. Question. Next question. Yeah. Uh, next question is, can I claim the foreign housing exclusion as a lump sum if we own our apartment and we pay it off? Uh, no. No, uh, there's specific rules about that. The foreign uh, earned housing exclusion specifically doesn't apply to mortgage payments or the purchase of a home. It's only for a couple of very specific things. It's for if you rent your home, it's for utilities, except for telephone and cable. Uh, it's for housing insurance, like rentals insurance uh, that you have. Uh, if you rent furniture or fixtures, uh, can claim that. Uh, small repairs, uh, generally I say $500 or less that you pay out of your own pocket. And for uh, if you have to pay for parking near your home, not where you work, but, but near your home. But specifically, uh, the law states that you, you can't claim that for owning an apartment. It's all for expenses regarding renting an apartment. Okay, thank you. If I invest in a foreign company, will I have to pay U.S. taxes on this? Um, if so, where would I add the amount on my tax return and what documentation will I need? Uh, okay, well, that that sounds like a straightforward question, but uh, that, that really raises uh, a lot, number of questions in my mind, which is okay. They're not necessarily bad. I'm not trying to discourage you from doing this. It might be a great idea. But first of all, you, you have to report all of your worldwide income. Uh, on your U.S. tax return, no matter where you get it. So the question comes into, um, okay, how do you characterize this income or what type of income is it? Okay, so you might be receiving a dividend from the company. You, you'll have to report that as, as dividends. Normally, that would be a, an ordinary dividend. You might be able to get ordinary dividend treatment if it was a corporation formed in a U.S. possession or if it's a corporation in a country that the U.S. has a tax treaty with. Um, you uh, might, well, when you sell the investment, if you ultimately sell the investment, right, then you have to calculate the profit or loss that you had on that. And that'll uh, most likely be a, a capital gain or capital loss. Um, those, those are really the, the general categories that you're looking at, uh, basically uh, a dividend and then when you ultimately sell the stock, looking at the gain or loss. Um, it gets a little more complicated if this is structured in a different way. For example, you're part of a partnership or you're part of a foreign uh, company and you, you purchase the shares through a foreign company. Uh, also, um, what's your role with this company? You know, are you simply an investor uh, or do you actually work for the company as well? So there's a lot of other issues to potentially consider. Um, but that's 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 the short and easy answer that I can offer right now. Yeah, and you'll want to be careful with the ownership percentage as well, because typically once you own more than 10 percent of a foreign corporation, then you get into 5471 requirements. If it's more than 50% owned by U.S. persons, it's a whole nother mess of forms that you'll need. So it, it's definitely something to speak with an accountant about before you kind of take that plunge um, and start investing in foreign corporations. Oh, that's an excellent point, Tabla. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. And actually, Alan touched on this a little bit earlier in that question when he mentioned that worldwide income is reported. We have someone that asks, you know, I'm living in a country with a tax treaty. Do I still need to report my income if it's going to be exempt with the treaty? Uh, yes. Yes, you do. You still have to report it. You have to report all of your worldwide income, even if there's a tax treaty in place. And then basically what you do is you, uh, through the tax treaty, uh, you file a treaty-based position, and then you, you do what's called resourcing the income. So even though it was earned... For example, maybe it's investment income earned in the United States. Uh, the treaty allows you to consider it as if it's earned in the country, the foreign country that you're living in, and therefore allows you to claim a foreign tax credit against it. Uh, typically, that's how it works. Uh, or 
you know, in this case, there could just be a, an exemption. Perhaps it's a treaty with the UK where uh, Social Security is simply exempt. Uh, in that case, um, you there's a couple of different ways to two different approaches to report something like that, where you would have zero income on your US tax return. The first is to simply leave it off your 1040. And I, I don't recommend doing that. What I recommend in cases like that is first you add the income and then you subtract the income. You show it those two things specifically on your tax form. That way you're giving the IRS a full view on all of your income. And that's by far the, the safest approach to, uh, to take. Otherwise, if you get audited, they might have suspicions that you're trying to hide income, even though it's, you know, you're not, but that's by far and large, the safest way to do it. Add your income and then subtract it. Sure. All right. Okay. I have a question here. I make $50,000 and I'll owe nothing for federal tax. If I claim the foreign earned income exclusion, does this bar me from contributing to a Roth IRA? Um, yes. Yes, and uh, I'm very glad that this question came up because making IRA contributions uh, while overseas is, uh, as it was, is a mistake that I unfortunately see a lot. It can be a very costly mistake. So uh, if you want to make a IRA contribution, whether it's a traditional IRA or it's a Roth IRA, you need what's called earned income. There's so many different <laughs> definitions in the tax code. What earned income is straightforward. It's income that you earn from salary or from wages, bonus, commission. Uh, if you own your own business as a sole practitioner, for example, self-employment income, those are all earned income. So uh, if you earn 50000 for example, then you take the foreign earned income exclusion, right? You subtract 50000 so you're left with zero earned income. So if you make any kind of IRA contribution, uh, you're looking at uh, a 6% penalty per year for an excess contribution, okay? Uh, and then, uh, so you have to, you wanna take that contribution out as soon as you can because that adds up every year. And then also you have to look at the earnings that that investment, that, that contribution made and you have to pull out that investment as well. So there's a 10% there's a early withdrawal penalty from that. Uh, and you also have to include that uh, investment income on your tax return. So uh, it, it gets a little bit complicated as I, as I guess I was trying to allude to here. So um, what you might wanna do instead, if you wanna contribute uh, to an IRA is consider not taking the foreign earned income exclusion but instead maybe take the foreign tax credit. But there's pros and cons to doing it both ways. So you might want to actually uh, talk to us so I can kind of walk you through all of your options. And, 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 and definitely everybody, uh, please be careful before you make any IRA contributions of any type uh, when you're living overseas. Uh, uh, penalties, I've seen people make contributions over years and years when they shouldn't have, and it's an expensive mess to try to fix. So it's best to try to prevent that situation from happening to yourself. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we'll try to squeeze in a few more questions here. We're almost out of time. Um, we have one that says, I filed my return in 2019. I used paper forms and mailed it in, but I haven't heard back yet. Should I refile? Uh, no, no, you shouldn't refile. Uh, maybe you're concerned as to whether the IRS actually got your returns or not. You know, of course, maybe maybe they, maybe it got lost in the mail or something. So what you can do is you can file a um, tax transcript request, and that's form forty six oh five T or forty five oh six T. I forget the exact number. Sorry, uh, but it's you you can basically file this with the IRS, going back to three years. Uh, and they provide you what's called a tax transcript. So it's basically just kind of a list by line number, uh, you know, with what they have for that tax year. So we'll show, for example, a line for wages and an amount, just a line for interest and the amount, so on and so forth. So you can request one of those. And if you get it back and everything is zero, well, that means they don't have any information for you for the year. So then that means you need to, uh, I would, 
instead of just sending in the return again, what I would do is I would file an amended return on form 1040 X, uh, explain that you got your tax transcript, but the IRS didn't seem to have received, uh, you know, your return. Uh, I would include the original return behind it and a copy of the trans uh, tax transcript as well. Follow up another six months to make sure they got that one. Yeah, and Alan, you know, you you might have noticed as well. I am seeing that the IRS is really behind on processing paper filed anything. Um, so it, it seems to be taking longer than even it used to do, um, just because of COVID and they were shut down for you know part of last year. So it's definitely taking a long time for anything that's mailed in to get any type of response. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We have another question here. On my previous FBAR and FATCA forms, I didn't include dormant foreign accounts with a zero balance. Um, do I need to amend them? And if so, how is the best way to do that? We also had some questions in the chat that mentioned just missing accounts. So these same rules would apply for those as well. Uh, yeah, that question kind of comes up quite a bit. Uh, if you look at the letter of the law, it, uh, it says you have to report all of your accounts if you exceed the threshold, okay? So technically, and unfortunately, it does include those zero balance accounts. Um, there's some different opinions out there about whether you should include these on the FBAR or not. Uh, you know, I, I like to, because the penalties are so harsh with FBARs, you know, I, I like to try to follow as closely as I can. And I say, uh, yes, you know, you need to go ahead and file these, include these accounts, even the zero dollar. Okay. So what you can you can do is two things. Number one, you can file an amended FBAR. So for that, you need your, your BSA number for the original FBAR. Those always come through emails to you. And you just file it and you explain that you didn't include these accounts. Okay. Um, that's a little bit more work than the other way, which I suggest is just to simply file a new FBAR for each of those years. There's a section that says, you know, you explain why you're filing late and just say, I filed previously. This is a $0 account. Uh, I didn't know I had to report it. I'm reporting it now. And for practically speaking, uh, sometimes if you don't have over $10,000 listed on the FBAR, you can't file it. So if you have some $0 accounts that you want to report, you're going to have to check highest balance unknown during the year. Okay, so check that box to be able to file it. And then within the comments section that you use to explain why you're filing late, just include a little bit of extra information. I listed it as highest balance unknown. The actual balance is zero. All right. Okay, wonderful. Well, we have a couple that came in the chat as well related to uh, what you were just talking about. Um, and they asked, does that same rule apply as far as contributing to an IRA when you have no income that's been taxed to HSA contributions? Uh, I'm sorry, could you say the question again one more time, Tabitha? Yeah, we had someone who asked if those same rules apply for HSA contributions as they would for an IRA contribution, where you need to have income you know, that's been taxed in the U.S. Um, yes, um, but there's the additional requirement of the HSA uh, health savings account uh, is, you know, generally you, you have to have a high deductible insurance policy. Uh, so if you're living outside of the United States, you're almost never going to qualify for that. Uh, so this is yet another case where you would be making excess contributions subject to 6% per year that's left in there. Uh, as well as some additional penalties, and it, it could turn out to be a real mess that you want to get straightened out as soon as possible. Okay, wonderful. Okay, everybody. Well, we are officially over time here. Um, there's a couple questions that we weren't able to get to. So, you know, I, again, if you guys have questions you still want to discuss, feel free to email us, info at greenbacktaxservices.com. Um, and then also we do offer one-on-one -on -one consultations with our accountants. Um, and those are perfect if you have really specific questions to your situation, um, or if you just want to have a lot, you know, more of a tax planning session to really make sure that your financial situation is in order, you know, if you're abroad or if you have income abroad, et cetera. 
Um, we do those all the time. They're super helpful. As you can see, Alan is a wealth of information and all of our accountants on the team are really fantastic. We only hire the best of the best and uh, we really pride ourselves on that. So thank you so much, Alan, for all of your time today. Thank you all for joining us from all over the world. This has been so wonderful. Um, again, we did record this, so if anyone has to hop off or if they just want to go through and hear everything again, check out that recording afterwards. Okay. Thanks, well, thank everybody. Thank you for attending, everyone. Bye.